As Mrs. Eddy established her new home, she was also taking steps to establish her church anew. The months ahead would place heavy demands on her as founder and leader. As the ambassador of Christ's teachings, I admonish you, delay not longer to commence building our church in Boston. Those were the words Mrs. Eddy addressed to her church in July 1892, just after her move to Pleasant View. Construction plans had languished in the hands of the building committee. That September, Mrs. Eddy reorganized her church. She signed a deed of trust which established the Christian Science Board of Directors and conveyed to them a piece of land in Boston on condition that they build a church on the site. The time for completion was set at two years, by the end of 1894. In her eyes, any thought that would obstruct that goal was an error that must be overcome. But every day brought financial and technical roadblocks in Boston. The rest of 1892 went by, and most of 93, and not a stone had been laid. In September, Mrs. Eddy stepped in, instructing that the foundation be built before winter. The directors refocused their efforts. In less than three months, the pilings and foundation were done. Now there was a renewed rush of enthusiasm among members of the church. Donations poured in. Even the children were busy raising money, penny by penny, to furnish a retiring room especially for Mrs. Eddy's use. Their efforts earned them the nickname, Busy Bees. Work on the walls was contracted to start the following spring. Again, problems brought things to a standstill. Again, Mrs. Eddy intervened. At her urging, all thoughts were concentrated on laying the cornerstone on the appointed day, May 21, 1894. With the walls only waist high, the officers were directed to complete the structure and hold services in it by the end of the year. They had seven months to go. An energetic couple, Edward and Caroline Bates, came on the scene to spearhead the work of teams of contractors and laborers. Steadily, the walls grew, the roof went on, and the bell tower rose. But setbacks, undelivered materials, contractor disputes caused delay after delay. By mid-December, with parts of the interior unplastered, untiled, and unfurnished, Mrs. Eddy's goal might have looked hopeless to most eyes, but not to hers. She wrote the directors, the day is well nigh won. Hold your services in the Mother Church December 30, 1894, and dedicate this church January 6th. With love, Mother. With fresh conviction, church officers and members renewed their efforts. Plasterers worked side by side with masons, painters, electricians, and woodworkers. The last week of December, some details were still unfinished, but in obedience to their leader, scaffolding came down and members pitched in to scrub and shine. Saturday evening, as the clock struck midnight, it was ready. And on the last Sunday of 1894, the morning light gleamed on the polished pews for the first service in the Mother Church. At the dedication services in January, the congregation heard a message composed for the occasion by Mrs. Eddy, but they would not see her there in person, leading a triumphal entry into her church. To Calvin Fry and me, our leader said that she would reject all earthly honors and adulation, that when she saw the church, which was her own vine and fig tree which love had given her, she would visit it when no one knew she was coming. Clara Shannon. In the next few months, she began laying a foundation of a different kind for her church, a foundation of laws. In March, she instructed the directors to gather rules, which she had written and authorized over the years, into a church manual of bylaws. One noteworthy new bylaw would declare, I, Mary Baker Eddy, ordain the Bible and science and health with key to the scriptures, pastor over the Mother Church, the First Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, Massachusetts. Later, she would add, and they will continue to preach for this church and the world. 
Mrs. Eddy had ended the era of personal preaching in her church. With this foundation work on the church manual underway, she was ready to see for herself the result of the labor of the previous three years. On the 1st of April, unannounced, Mrs. Eddy, Calvin Fry, and Clara Shannon boarded a train in Concord. At Boston's Union Station, they hailed a hackney cab and rode to the church. The directors had been told only to have someone on hand to give some friends a tour of the interior. Joseph Armstrong, the director in charge of building the church, was taken completely by surprise. Clara Shannon tells us, Mother then walked into the auditorium, and I followed and remained at the end of the church. Our leader walked up the left aisle of the church facing the reader's desk, went very slowly, and at times she would stand still, look up and around, until she reached the reader's platform and stopped at the steps leading up to it. There she knelt on the first step. After some minutes, she stepped up onto the platform and stood quietly at each reader's desk. Then she left the platform and walked slowly up the other aisle, her eyes taking in every detail. Biographer Robert Peel writes, on an evening 27 years before, she had been turned out of a house some 40 miles from there into the pouring rain, without friends, without money, with no place to go for shelter, with nothing but a vision and an unshakable sense of mission. Now she was in her own church, and it was a moment for both wonder and responsibility. Some of her students were called. She had a lesson to teach them and words of encouragement for each one. Afterward, a few would stay to take care of anything she might need. One of them, Janet Coleman's husband, Irwin, in the early days had helped clean rented halls to make them ready for her sermons. Now he managed their own building. Mrs. Eddy was escorted across the foyer to the mother's room, furnished by all those pennies contributed by the busy bees, where supper, prepared that morning at Pleasant View, was laid out. After supper, she said she would like to see the church lighted up. Our leader went into the auditorium and walked up the same aisle and again stood at the first reader's desk. She repeated aloud, the 91st Psalm. Then she went to the second reader's desk and in such a pleading voice, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Then there was silence, such a silence. Mother crossed the church and noticed Mr. Coleman, weeping. He was so overcome by what he had just seen and heard. Our leader sat beside him, touched his shoulder and said, Why, brother, don't you remember in the days gone by, when you and I had to pick up pieces of paper and bits of orange peel in order to make the room clean? Her conversation brought smiles to his face while they sat and conversed together. Clara Shannon At last, she made her way back up the aisle, still looking all around her as she went, and returned to her room where she spent the night. Next morning, the party returned to Pleasant View. Mrs. Eddy would visit her church publicly, but unannounced, on a Sunday some six weeks later, when she delivered an impromptu sermon to the surprised congregation. The following January, on Communion Sunday, she came a third time again unannounced. This time, word leaked out, and the church was packed to the walls for her. It was to be her final appearance there. 